Uh, welcome to Lead by Choice, a place where we work together to build authentic leaders. And today I'm super stoked and very, very honored to have John Stoker all the way from uh, Ohio in uh, the US. We are right now chatting on a Saturday afternoon for me and it's more early morning for John. Today we are going to be discussing a very interesting book that John is just about uh, to release. It, what captivated me about it was just the topic, the, the title of the book, Overcoming Fake Talk. And I saw that you framed a very captivating story at the beginning. This is the story of the World War II, uh, well, was it World War I or uh, World War II veteran? Yes. Yeah. Who uh, uh, crash landed. Exactly. And, and the French resistance, right, uh, to save him, buried him. Um, and he was breathing through a garden hose. And they did that every day uh, for a couple weeks. Um, so one, I think he was probably afraid just being buried. That's probably a little claustrophobic. But then the other thing, if you read the longer version of the story, he thought, you know, am I going to lay here while I'm being looked for and somebody's going to plant a bayonet in the ground and it will just so happen to go into me? Uh, and so he said, I think that was the first time he had ever experienced, I guess, what he referred to as stark, raving fear. Um, you know, I did research a couple of years ago about the things that kind of uh, keep people um, from kind of speaking up. And there were actually 10, but only five made them into the book. But what was interesting was, is that I just went over those quickly and then showed you something about them, which makes them interesting. When we ask people, why don't they share what they're really thinking and feeling or speak up? The first thing that came, of course, it was a business setting. People said, well, you know, I could lose my job if I say that. Uh, the second one was, is, well, you know, I kind of don't know what to say. Notice that kind of implies that there's a, a right way and a wrong way to say things, and they were afraid to say it wrongly, I guess you'd say, and so they'd rather not say anything at all. Um, I don't want to hurt someone's feelings. That was a big one. Um, and I don't know how, how they will respond. Now, that one for me is about conflict resolution. And you know that about 80% of people are afraid of conflict. They would avoid it at all costs. So they're really saying there, if this gets nasty or if the person gets emotional, I won't, what, I won't know what to do, so I'd rather not go there. And then this was interesting. People under 32 was kind of the mean age, said, if I speak up, then they probably won't like me, which was very interesting that they were concerned, younger folks were concerned about whether they'd be liked or not. Now, what's interesting about those, when I first started to kind of put those all together, I thought, Notice how interesting those are from the perspective that what people are doing is projecting into the future with no evidence in the present that nothing is going to happen. So if I just took one, oh, I could lose my job, right? So notice that's a projection. It's not going to happen. And so if I pushed back a little bit and said, well, how do you know that will happen? Right, so I'm testing them a little bit. Then they, they have a, a story of something that happened in their past. Right? Well, my spouse spoke up, you know, and from then on out, her work was so miserable, she finally had to quit. But notice it's the spouse's story and not their story. So what people do is they project into the future something that's going to happen that hasn't even happened. And then they use some kind of a story, either from their past or someone else's past, to justify the projection that they've made so they don't have to say anything. Yeah. Now, that's a little, maybe that's a little academic, but I thought, how interesting that we would go through such a mental, I guess, exercise uh -huh. to validate our decision that, hey, I'm not going to speak up. But the bottom line is, is, if we don't speak up, then nothing improves. You know, so part of fake talk, right, is the fact that people withhold. Yeah. So what, what do they do? They, they go along to get along. They'll agree. Um, they'll choose to say nothing if you want. 
But in reality, that's fake talk because it doesn't give you the results that you re may really want, nor does it improve respect, nor is the relationship uh, built or improved. What is actually driving all this behavior is fear. And uh, there's a high cost to this fear and uh, what, it, wh what it boxes us into. And I think that's what you're trying to look at also in overcoming fake talk. Yes, yes. Particularly, you know, we think that, we think, I think we're very guarded at work, but at home we're not so guarded. So we might speak really what we're thinking and feeling to someone that we're close to, a child, a spouse, and yet sometimes the way that we speak is almost more damaging um, than if we hadn't said anything at all. Mm -hmm. I know sometimes I've gotten in trouble with my spouse <laughs> for saying, <laughs> for saying what I, right, which for saying what I really thought, um, and you know, and, the, and she'll kind of chide me for that, and then I'll have to back up and say, "All right, you're right." You know, I said I didn't do a very good job of the way I kind of put that because then it makes her makes her somewhat resistant to being open to feedback. You know, kind of going forward, but. Yeah, I think fear is a big factor in, in that we just kind of don't, we have to admit, we really don't know what's going to happen in the future, and yet we ought to balance that, our fear, with what it is that we really want or what's really important to us. Yep. And, and if we, we stopped and did that, then maybe we'd realize, you know what, it really is worth talking about this, because I want some things to change, and I want our relationship to be improved. and. I want to know this other person right, respects me, and I respect them. Exactly, and I think you really bring out a very important point that for us to over overcome our fake talk, there has to be some reciprocity in that we need to accept that we've also made a mistake and approach the other party seeking for um, either forgiveness or restitution or just um, a closure, a bring to cl a closure to that specific uh, uh, event of conflict. Yeah, I would even add to that understanding. If we just took time to understand each other, you know, maybe we'd learn some things. Maybe we'd think differently. Maybe we could solve our problems. But we're so entrenched in kind of sometimes I think what we want or what we think is important that, you know, we don't, we forget about that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So how do we get out of our stinking thinking, as you as you put it in, <laughs> in one of your, of your chapters? Well, you know, I have to first just say that I, you look at the headings on the chapter, they're a little, <laughs> chapters, they're a little irreverent, aren't they? Yep. Uh, and the reason that I did that is because I kind of wanted people to, I wanted to draw people in and I wanted to make them think. So, um, you know, our thinking, I think oftentimes has us rather than us having it. Let me give you an example. You know, when I wrote the book, the publishing company said, we would like you to record a little video vignette with a story or a principle or something mm -hmm. that's not in the book. And then we'll put at the end of every chapter a little thing that says, for more information on this topic, go yeah. to www.generalremont, whatever. Yeah. And, and it's there. It's the end of every chapter. So I'm recording those in my basement. Um, and we moved our offices into our basement after the recession here in the U.S. Uh -huh. So my wife is coming out of a side office, and she's holding a new camera we have mm -hmm. for doing recordings in one arm and a set of paper towels in, in her other arm. Mm -hmm. And I look at her and I say, I certainly hope you didn't wipe the lens of that camera with that paper towel. <laughs> and she stops and says, hey, you want to try that again, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> so notice what I did. Yeah. I saw her just holding the camera and the paper towels, and I assumed the worst. Exactly. And I basically kind of started to get after her, and she didn't like it. And she called me on it. I think that we do that and worse without even realizing that we're doing it. Mm -hmm. So I observed, I interpreted her behavior negatively, and then I started to accuse her. So I would say one of the first steps 
and, and noticing if you want your stinking thinking is about being able to recognize what it is you are thinking. And, and then another thing would be to notice, well, what results are you getting? Because our behavior is driven by the way we think about things. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not getting the results that you want, you almost have to backtrack on what it is that you were thinking because the thinking will drive what you say, what you do, how you treat people. So mm -hmm. that's one thing. Now, in the book, we mentioned the skill, the C skill. So first, if you can recognize what you're thinking, well, I'm thinking that she is intentionally, maybe even unintentionally, doing things that might ruin the camera. Great. <laughs> if I can surface that thought, yeah. then I can use the C skill, which is the first S in C, S-E-E, -E, is surface my thinking. So if I can see it, now I can examine it for its accuracy. So the E, the next E, is kind of explore your the accuracy. I could say, do I absolutely know for sure that she's intentionally wiped the camera lens or that she's even wiped it? No. Yep. So then the other E, the last E, is explore understanding. What do I know? What do I not know? What do I need to know? So if I just took a moment to first surface my thinking and then just examine it for its accuracy, um, that would probably help me get out of what it is that I'm thinking before mm -hmm. or I do or say something that I may regret, if that makes sense. But yeah, you, we do it. It's just all, it's the way we're kind of hardwired, mm -hmm. right? We see or hear things. We interpret like that. And oftentimes without additional data. Yeah. Our, our thinking is negative. So you have to see what it is you're thinking before you can really kind of challenge it for its accuracy. Finally, we're just going to explore a little bit about um, ego, where ego comes <laughs> in and um, just try to think about how do we rise up against uh, this ego that will always wrap its ugly head and move forward and make sure that our conversations and um, our relationships now become a little more authentic. Yes, we might clash and all, but we will come back together and learn, um, you know, to engage with each other, to commune with each other. Okay, so here's the thing. Ego is really how we esteem ourselves. You think about that. I think ego, the word ego, he, he has an ego, has a negative connotation. And it doesn't necessarily have to be Negative. So I, I, I try to esteem myself well. You try to esteem yourself well. I think another word for ego might be personal values. All right. So um, I didn't know much about ego when I started this trip about, oh, man, eight years, ten years ago. And I, I hired a couple psychologists to help me with that. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, that's easy. Ego's easy. Ego... There's 1,400 ego needs. Wow. And, and, and I go, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, you know, when, when people get emotional negatively, not positively, but negatively, really what you're seeing is a violated value, a violated ego need. And I go, oh, that's interesting. So, you know, I started to notice that. So let's say one of my people came to me and said, John, you're always so busy. You never listen to me. Now, now that's a negative statement. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think I put this in the book, which is kind of fun. So if I hear that negative statement, what's hidden behind the negative statement is a positive value. So I ask myself, what is it that that person wanted? Or what was important to them? Well, they wanted my time or attention. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to be listened to. That's the positive value. So one of the things that's interesting about ego, the stuff on ego in my book is in the listening part of the book. And the reason it is is because we don't often listen and attend to people in ways that are meaningful. So rather than being kind of derailed by someone's emotion, negative emotion, if I can recognize that their emotional reaction is really nothing more than a violated value, 
then it helps me to realize that I need to get past the ego to what's driving the emotion. In fact, I like to say emotion is the mask of meaning. Mm -hmm. So I could make a grimacing face like this and say, what do you think that means? And you can say, oh, you're angry at me. Mm -hmm. But then I might say, no, actually, I ate something for lunch that's uh, that's not not <laughs> sitting very <laughs> sitting very very well. Yeah. So we're very quick to judge and assess mm -hmm. what people's outward expression is, but in reality, we have to admit that we don't know what that means until we explore it or try to understand it. And so. Ego, for me, is really kind of easy. I mean, you know that a person is observing, and then they're interpreting. So if I did something um, that was offensive to you, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden, you started to get a little testy mm -hmm. in the tone of your voice, you might say, well, geez, John, right? You <laughs> used that kind of a tone and did exactly. that with your head. Exactly. I would know that you've interpreted it something. Mm-hmm negatively and then it's probably gotten what's important to you involved it's a it's a some kind of a value that I may have violated without really even intending to mm -hmm. so now what am I gonna do if I made it very simple I'm gonna ask questions to try to understand what's going on I might even say something like well I noticed that you just kinda got a little upset with me mm -hmm. what's going on what yeah. are you thinking and, and the reason is is because I have to get to that thinking behind the mask, if you will, of emotion. So it's not only feelings, by the way. Some people are quite, I mean, I'm, you can see I'm quite animated. Mm -hmm. So you would see my feelings. But some people are, are, are not so open with their feelings. So they may just do an action. They may come in, sit down in my office and look at the floor and not say anything mm -hmm. for five minutes. Mm -hmm. So I could reflect that. Or somebody might say, oh great, just what I wanted to do today. Now notice there's a little emotion in their voice, but what they're really showing me is a, a verbal message. Mm -hmm. So I could either reflect to the person, I can see you're upset, or I heard you say this morning in the meeting, oh great, now what? Or I heard you, um, I noticed you just came into the office and sat down and looked at the floor for 10 minutes. Right? Tell me what's going on with you. So I can reflect to the person not only their emotion but also their words and also their action to try to get behind that mm -hmm. which will help me what's going on, understand what's going on with them, what they value. Thank you very much John for your time and I uh, um, hope to see you again on Lead by Choice. And let's uh, grow together. Let's be authentic together. Thank you very All right. much. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. You have a great rest of your day.